Amen. There was a day when you believed. That is so good. Acts chapter 7, if you will, look at verse uh, 24, 25 again. The Bible says, in seeing uh, one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that oppressed that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Now, he's thinking that, okay, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and defend this, uh, this Hebrew, if you will. I'm going to take care of the problem. I'm going to step up to the plate. Certainly, all my brothers is going to understand this. The Bible says in verse 25, and he supposed his brethren uh, with that understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. I want to speak tonight on the danger of being impatient with God. God, the danger of being impatient with God. I have a New England friend of mine that's a pastor, and uh, I was uh, preaching for him uh, one time up in uh, um, the uh, Boston area, and um, I was in the office there, and he, he kept pacing back and forth. He was kind of anxious about something. I, I, I don't know what it was all about, but he was a little bit anxious, and he was pacing back and forth in his office, and I asked him the question. I said, well, what's the matter? I mean, what's going on? And he said, well, and this is what he said. I wrote it down because I thought one day I'll use that as an illustration, and so it is tonight. And so uh, he said this, the trouble is I'm in a hurry, but God isn't. And I wrote that down. And I thought, you know, isn't that typical as to the way we live our lives? Because we get in a hurry, but we fail to realize that God is not in a hurry. The Bible says to make not haste. Uh, in other words, don't be in a hurry when it comes to making decisions. Uh, some of the biggest uh, decisions that I have ever made in my life that floundered and flopped that did not work out well was when I was younger and I thought I have to make a decision now. Uh, and, uh, and oftentimes, as a young preacher, when I was a pastor in Tennessee, a church member would come to me with a pressing issue and say, Pastor, we need to handle this right now. And I would often say, if I have to handle it right now, then the answer is no. Uh, you have to give me time to pray. You have to give me time to think. Uh, oftentimes when our children would come up and they would say, Dad, can I do this now? Can you tell me now I can do this? Would this be okay if I do this now? When I felt like I was pressed, I would always say, if you're pressing me for an answer now, the answer is no. You got to give me time to think it through. You have to give me time to evaluate. You have to give me time. Now, by the way, some of us are quick evaluators, while others of us are slow evaluators. But may I say, God is not one to be judged whether he answers your prayer on your timetable or whether he chooses to answer prayer on his timetable, his timetable always being best. So let's notice some things tonight. Uh, you think about Moses here. This is the story about Moses. If you were to read Acts chapter 7, verses 18 through 24, you'll see the abbreviated story of Moses there, uh, how, of course, uh, Pharaoh was there, and God used Moses to deliver the Israelites out of bondage. You'll see here that uh, this is a time where uh, Moses, to begin with, uh, before he enters into his time of being on the backside of the desert, was in patient uh, uh, you know he thought I would just take it upon myself to bring the deliverance and that wasn't God's way to do it a point in case is Moses was a very great man God used him in a wonderful way and God used him in a wonderful way to be able to perform the task that God had for him to deliver the Israelites out of bondage Hebrews chapter 11 you'll see that Moses makes uh, some decisions and you'll see why he made those decisions as we study a little bit about his character tonight you'll see that certainly was a man of faith certainly was a man that believed in God certainly was a man that stepped forward when it came time to step forward and be obedient to God after God uh, brought him to the place of the desert but we know this about his story we know that he was born in a time of trouble we know that uh, the Israelites they had only one God that they knew to serve while those that were of the Egyptian birth had many gods that they worshiped you'll see that the hebrews were multiplying 
And uh, you'll find this out, that when persecution time comes among believers, oftentimes more than not, they multiply. The Hebrews were multiplying so much the so that the Egyptians felt as though if they would rise up and form an army that they'd certainly wipe the Egyptians out. Pharaoh felt very uncomfortable about that. And so Pharaoh decided instead of these becoming potential soldiers that might one day rise up and overtake my kingdom and destroy uh, me and others that are here, I'll just take care of it early and I'll take care of it now. And so he made a decision he made a law that the first uh, born that were of the male stature, male children, if you would, would be destroyed and bodies thrown into the Nile. Jochebed, which is Moses' mother, decided, well, I don't, I don't want this. This is a goodly child. God gave me this child. I like to protect this child. So she built an ark out of bulrushes, and she set that ark afloat uh, right there uh, in the Nile River, close to where uh, it would drift among the flags and not be seen. Well, lo and behold, here comes Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter comes out, and, uh, uh, and there's a, a maid that's there, and they, they hear the, uh, the whimpering of the baby, and they go down, and they uh, see the baby, and long story short, uh, uh, the baby needed somebody to nurse it, and, and, and it was that which was Jochebed that was called to nurse the baby and take care of the baby. That, by the way, Jochebed being Moses' mother, and so for all those years, now Moses is going to be trained under that which is the lips and the tutorship of his mother and by the way she got paid for it that's pretty good uh, we understand that there was a day uh, when all this was going to take place acts chapter 7 and verse 22 the bible says and moses uh, was learned in all the wisdom of the egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. So uh, he was there learning underneath the tutorship of his mother about the things of God, the wisdom of God, and how God would move in a marvelous way to those that would yield themselves to him. And uh, also, he was being instructed about the ways and the deeds of that which was the Egyptians. And so he knew both sides of uh, of the coin and so mama kept his heart tender one day he's out walking and he sees an egyptian taskmaster uh, beating in a hebrew he decides he's going to intervene he decides he's going to take care of the situation so moses rises up he takes matters into his own hands and he strikes and kills the taskmaster begins to bury him in the sand thinking that everybody would understand but as we read in uh, acts chapter 7 and verse 25 they did not understand you see, when we do things ahead of God, people just kind of shake their head and they don't really understand. When we see a, a, a young person, if you would please, that don't save themselves to marriage, to walk down a marriage aisle, we that know the Bible, we just shake our heads and we just really don't understand. When we see somebody gets under pressure and they begin to say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll handle my own pressure. And they go out there and they start doing drugs and they start drinking. We kind of shake our heads, those of us that's a little bit more mature in Christ, and we just really don't understand why they do that. When we see somebody goes out and they waste their life uh, in riotous living, uh, we look at that, we kind of shake our hands, we think how foolish they are and how stupid they are, and we just really don't get it. We don't understand how come they would do something like that. When we see people that uh, knows uh, that if they uh, give their tithes and their offerings that God will open the windows of heaven and God will bless them and yet they choose not to do it but slap God in the face and then all of a sudden they, they can't purchase this because they don't have money and they can't purchase this because they don't have money and they're always coming up short of money at the end of the month and this breaks down and that breaks down and it seems like that God has cursed everything that they touch instead of it turning to that which is diamonds and gold it's turned turning to that which is coal and dirt. And, uh, and uh, we just, those of us that know the Bible and a little bit more mature, we step back a little bit, we kind of shake our heads, and we say, man, we just don't understand that. You know, when we have a Bible that tells us what to do, it would be really good if we would sit up and pay attention to all that God has for us in the Bible. Uh, God sent uh, Moses to the backside of the desert for 40 years. 40 years, he stays on the backside of the desert. What's happening? Well, God is going to put him in training. 
God is going to train him as to what he should do when he should do it so that he can do it the next time of the right time. So let's notice some things tonight. Statement number one. Uh, impatience with God will cause us to do foolish things. Impatience with God will cause us to do foolish things. Uh, Moses knew what was right to do, but he chose to do wrong. Moses knew he shouldn't have killed that man, but he killed him anyway. Moses knew he shouldn't have took manners into his own hands, but he did it anyway. Moses knew he shouldn't have buried the uh, man and uh, uh, hid and ran, if you will, but he did it anyway. James chapter 1 and verse 20, the Bible says that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So we have to be very careful to understand that when we do foolish activity, it puts us in a place whereby God is forced to react to that uh, foolish activity. Uh, Paul wrote this to those that were at Galatia. He said this, he says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14, it says, uh, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And if, uh, this is always, I show this in my premier counseling, I say, now please don't do this because, you know, it would probably hurt. But Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14, the Bible says, but if ye bite, and he's talking to people in church. Can you imagine people in church biting each other? The Bible says, but if ye bite and devour one another, he says, take heed uh, that uh, ye be not consumed one of another. And of course, that's talking about your words, but you know, uh, uh, figuratively speaking, you can just imagine somebody getting mad at somebody else in church, and here, here's a 45-year-old woman, and, and gets mad at a 55-year-old woman, and she goes out in the hallway and says, I'm going to teach you a lesson, and she says, give me your arm, and she begins to bite it. You know, that's probably not a good scene. Now, here's what we see. God says they're not supposed to bite each other, and they're not supposed to devour each other. And so uh, Christians are not supposed to take matters in their, well, you know, he slapped me, I'll slap him. He talked bad about me on Facebook. I'm going to talk bad about him on Facebook. Let's get it on. I mean, he pulled in my parking spot, so I'll bump him out so that I get the parking spot. Uh, uh, I think it was him that scratched my car, and so therefore I'm going to scratch his car. I mean, I can't believe they picked up my hymn book. They know that that's my hymn book. I've been uh, touching that. It's probably got my fingerprints all over it. They should know that's my hymn book, and they picked it up. Oh, I can't believe they sat in my pew. I mean, uh, I've been at this church a whole lot longer than they have been, and they've had the the, the nerve and the audacity to come and to sit in my pew I just I can't believe she sang that song I've been practicing that song for months and uh, and she knew I was going to sing that song and yet she got up and she sang it oh I'm so mad because she did a better job than I ever could and uh, oh it just bothers me so much at doing handshaking time I walk over this way to p shake people's hands and it seems like that everybody on this side when I walk this way to shake people's hands they move to the auditorium over here like I I've not wore my deodorant in months. And it just bothers me so very. I can't stand that person to sit in front of me. They're always happy. Oh, it drives me nuts about people. It's always happy. When I ask them how they're doing, they always say, God is good. God has been so good to me. I'm just so happy. I just can't stand it. It's like I'm riding on top of the butterfly's back as I'm going through the spring air. And oh, it just bothers me so very. I can't stand the way he comes combs his hair man the way he combs his hair uh, even if he did have lice it would never show up I mean it, it's got hairspray from one side of his face to the other side of his face and boy does it but I can't stand when they chew gum in church they look like a cow that's trying to eat uh, out there grazing in the pasture and if they would only see how ridiculous they look when they chew that gum looking like oh that but I can't stand when she wears black uh, what is she in more all the time I mean can't she figure out something else to wear other than black I mean what is the pro did you see her she dyed her hair I can't believe she dyed her hair I mean uh, and by the way if she was gonna dye her hair she shouldn't have dyed her hair that color I can't believe that my car broke down uh, has to be something about this parking lot every time I pull into this parking lot my car breaks down oh I just can't believe it I put money in the offering plate and I was waiting for you God I'm telling you I was waiting for you and you just did not give it back something must be wrong with you God oh no I don't think anything's wrong with the Lord 
I'm saying what takes place is we become impatient with God uh, and we and because we do that it can cause us to make foolish activity statement number two uh, impatience is often caused by believing God is not going to do anything we give up on it we say now God I've been praying for this for a long time and you didn't do it so I guess I'll just take care of it myself You've been praying down the list when Sylvia uh, became in my life. I had been praying for some time for uh, a dear lady that I could marry. And I had a specific prayer list. I mean, I, I had about 42, 43, 45 things on my list. And I prayed down the list. And I'm telling you, I prayed down the list faithfully several times a day. I would call it out. And uh, I was expecting God to answer prayer. I knew he wanted me to get married. Now, by the way, I could have married, and don't get mad at me when I say this, but I could have married anything that would have came along. And I had a lot of things that came along. Uh, I, I had girls in college that chased me. So what would you do? I ran harder. Uh, I'm saying this. I'm saying that... Uh, uh, Understand that uh, impatience causes us to believe that God isn't going to do anything. When you're impatient about something, you want it done now. Oh, come on. You kids are in college, whether you're in a, a, a secular college or whether you're in our Bible college. You know, if you're not careful, here's what happens. You want your degree right now, whether you get the education or not. But if you're going to be my surgeon, I would prefer you take time to get your education. Amen. If you're going to be my dentist, I would prefer you take time to get your education. Yeah. It's not about a piece of paper. It's about what you know. Right. Yeah. You understand tonight that uh, impatience can cause us to believe that God isn't going to do anything. Therefore, why wait? Some of the best things you'll ever have in your life are things that you wait for. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry when choosing the one you're going to marry. Don't be in a hurry in choosing the place you're going to live. Don't be in a hurry in choosing the church you're going to have membership in. Don't be in a hurry in teaching your children principles that you're not even sure of. Don't be in a hurry, if you would, in trying to get somebody to do something to react to you just because you want a momentary pleasure of their reacting to that which you want them to react to. Don't be in a hurry. Uh, don't uh, compromise your convictions just because you want a friend. Amen. Well, you know, I'll just compromise my convictions because I'm lonely. Well, how many times have you prayed about that? How many times have you showed yourself friendly? How many times? Oh, come on now, I love you, but I'm going to pick on you just a little bit right in your face. I hear people say, well, I'm lonely. I'm lo I told Brother Palmer and I were talking about that the other day. I said, I hear people saying this all the time. I'm lonely, I'm lonely. I said, we ought to start a Lonely Hearts Club, put everybody in the room, and that way all the lonely people could be lonely together whereby they find fellowship. Now, can I tell you this? Uh, you say, I'm lonely. Well, stay around. Come here. Stay around. Talk to people. You know, when you see somebody uh, walking down the hallway towards you, then uh, shake their hand. Good to see you. Hey. That didn't take much. Man. You know, uh, when, when all of a sudden uh, uh, they're rushing by you, they're rushing by, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to shake hands. Now, you know, that, that didn't take much. You, you, you know what I'm saying? You've got to be that individual that you step out and you be friendly. You know? Hey, uh, hey, someday I'd like to get together. And let, let's go down and get a hamburger. You like hamburgers? Boy, I like hamburgers. Can I tell you? I like hamburgers. I've gone through this little stage right now where I don't eat the bread. It's oh. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. yeah. People stare at you like a nut. Oh. They do. But I'm kind of enjoying it a little bit. Yeah. I am. I take my, I take my, I take my, 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 uh, no, that's a knife. I take my knife and I, and I cut it right there and I cut it right there and boy, I'll, I'll stick it with the, 
Nice. Porch. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. all right. Now, now, wait a minute. What? Here's, uh, and, and we could talk about, hey, and did you, I, 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 I tell you what, I like riding bikes. Yeah. If I ever got on my bike again, it'd be shocked to die of a heart attack, but I like riding bikes. Yeah. I like walking trails. Amen. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I like playing ball. I do. I do. I like, I, I could get back in pretty quick to playing basketball again. I like playing ball. You know, uh, uh, football, yeah, man, I like football. Football yeah. could be uh, just a neat thing. To do. And uh, it, it, we could talk about many things. Uh, you know, boy, I tell you, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Man, it's just, it's just neat. Uh, let me show you what I got out of my Bible right here. You know, All right, now, what am I saying? I'm saying this. There's many things you can talk about. Honestly, there's many things you can talk about. Now, you don't have to be uh, uh, overly uh, active like him. Thank you. But you could take and... <laughs> he runs up, he runs down. But you could take and be able to spend time with people. You could do that. Can I help you a little bit? We have a ladies' conference. Everybody that's a lady ought to come to a ladies' conference, and we have a ladies' conference. Uh, when, uh, uh, when, when there's uh, uh, different types of ladies' banquets... Come to them. Come to them. Oh, you say, I'm busy. Well, I understand busy, but could it be that you could also be an organizer in your life and maybe organize a couple of things in for the fellowship that you're lacking so bad? Yeah, it, it might be good for you to take a lady soul winning with you sometime. Just a fellowship. could be good if some of you ladies got together and said, hey, look, you know, there's this place over there where, where you can go uh, paint a picture together. Uh, some ladies went on a trip, and uh, they invited my wife to come. I thought that was sweet of them. They didn't have to invite her, but they did. But you know what they did? When they invited her, she said, uh-huh. So maybe what you can do is you can invite somebody else to come with you and go do something. Invite them. You know, I found out ladies like to shop. I find out men do not. So some of you ladies could get together. Uh, Daniel told me, Daniel Butler is here tonight, and uh, Daniel told me, he said, preacher, he said, you know, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a place to go hog hunting. Is that still available? Hog hunting. So what is that? That's where you take a gun and you go kill a hog. Because if you don't, it will bite your toe. And so, you know, there's a perfect opportunity. Some of you guys that love to go hunting, tag up with Daniel and say, hey, man, can we do that hog hunting thing together? Hey, let him get 20 or 30 guys. Go down there and kill yourself a mess of hogs. Now, I, I'm there's plenty of places to fellowship. You know, I know guys over the, over the spring and over the fall, they'll go fishing. Man, find, you know, find the guys that are going fishing and say, can I tag up with you? I'll even bring my own bait. Yeah. There's plenty of ways to... Uh, uh, some of our guys go over here and they do this Frisbee golf. Have you seen that, Doc? Don't do that, your back hurts. But uh, they got Frisbee golf over here. Now, I've seen some of our guys, they go out there and they enjoy that Frisbee golf. What is that? That's fellowship. That's fellowship. Some people are going out to that... Uh, uh, what's that called? First Monday? Friday? Thursday? Monday? Thursday? Canton. Canton. It's called First what? First Monday. Uh, you know, uh, tag up with some ladies sometime and go out there and, and, and walk around First M Monday in Canton. But First Monday is always held on a Friday. I don't understand that, but that's the way they do it. Somebody got confused that did not know the days of the week when they started that. Well, go out there and fellowship. I, I'm, I'm saying this. I'm saying that uh, we understand that impatience uh, uh, often uh, causes us to say, well, you know, I just believe not, that, that God is not going to do anything. I'm going to take things into my own hands. And so by doing, we make mistakes. Maybe you ought to just slow down a little bit and enjoy some things. You only live once. Well, you know, preacher, I'm serving God. I'm all for serving God. I'm all in. I'm pastor. I'm all in. But sometimes you got to take a break and drink some coffee. Sometimes you got to take a break and say, hey, look, hey, man, I just want to have a little bit of fun sometimes. 
Nothing sinful about it. Don't look at me so piously. There's nothing sinful about that. I, I, I'm saying this. I'm saying that uh, here he comes, and, and now it's like he just thinks that God doesn't care, and, and so I'll just take it into my own hands, and it ought not to be that way. Somebody wrote an email in pretense that they were God, and it said, from God. It said this, I am God, in pretense. Today I will handle all of your problems. Please remember uh, that I don't need your help. Uh, if life happens to deliver you a situation that you cannot handle, do not be tempted to solve it on your own. Kindly put it in your SFGT box, GTD box. That means this, something for God to do. Then address it to my attention, and I will handle it when I want to. Don't be pushy. Pretty good. Uh, Moses had a problem. Moses made a mistake simply because he acted because he felt like God was not going to come through and God could not deliver, so he took on the role of trying to deliver himself. Cain, if you would, made a mistake. Cain stepped out, said, I'm going to avenge my brother. I'm going to have vengeance on him, and he killed Abel. What did he do? That mistake turned into sin, and somebody lost their life. Delilah wanted to help herself to Samson's hair. Judas wanted the 30 pieces of silver more than he loved the Savior. The Bible says in James chapter 5 and in verse uh, 7, uh, Be patient, therefore, brethren, it says, Unto the coming of the Lord, uh, behold, the husband then waiteth, it says, for the precious fruit of the earth, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, uh, that have long patience for it, and he received uh, the early and the latter rain. James chapter 5 and in verse 8, the Bible says, uh, Be also patient. He's telling you, be like that guy. Be also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Uh, uh, Psalm 27 and verse 14, the Bible says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And so God is simply saying, wait. Statement number next. Uh, uh, our, our rash decisions can be used to God's glory. God can take your rash decisions, your, your brain-dead moments, where you jerk the wheel and do something you're not supposed to do, and still use it for his glory. How does he do that? Well, we read about Peter in the Bible, and Peter denied the Lord, and as he denied the Lord, the cock did crow. So uh, how did God use that? He reminds us not to be in a hurry by somebody else's life that was in a hurry. So God can take your rash decisions to remind somebody, don't do it that way. Don't go that way. Don't think about doing it that way. He can remind us. You think about uh, uh, Abraham, Abraham, a great man of faith, but in Genesis, you see that he struggled with his faith, and it's recorded. It's recorded. You think about David, David committed adultery, and then he arranged for his friend to be killed, but yet it's still recorded, still recorded. See, when I was growing up and, uh, in my family's household, I learned about all the good things that my dad and my mom did, but I also learned about the things they did do that wasn't good. No doubt you as a parent, your child right now is examining you. As I did my parents when I was 15 and 16 and 17 years of age, and I was coming up in the house, and I would say, okay, mom's doing that right now, and I'll never do that. Dad's doing that right now, and I would never do that. Then I wrote down some things, well, mom and dad, they're doing this, and they're doing this, I will do that. You know, uh, don't think that your teenager doesn't have a brain. Because right now, they're learning from you the things to do, and they're learning from you the things not to do. My dad, every time I'd say to my dad, I sure do love you, he would say, uh-huh. Never heard him say one time, I love you. My kids, my dear wife hear it all the time. I mean, every single day, several times a day, do my children and does my precious wife hear those words, I love you. I mean, why? Because I grew up in a household where there was not that. And I said, okay, I'm going to change that. That's something that I'm not going to adopt in my life. I'm going to change that. So we say, I love you in the morning. We say, I love you several times throughout the day. We say, I love you at night. 
uh, via text or phone call or some form of communication and there's a lot of love in the Wells family why because they had a dad they have a dad not had a dad I'm so around they, they have a dad that grew up in a household that did not show any love at all when I grew up in the household and my parents was fussing and fighting and throwing words across the room that was so heavy that it would choke you I said I'm not going to do that I'm not going to do that. I'd get my boy's attention, and I'd say, oh, you look at me right now. You're going to do that right now. I didn't have to holler at him across the room. I'd say, come here, we're going to talk. This is what you're going to do. Oh, I might have to uh, uh, give them some corporal punishment and kind of uh, exercise their energy in that direction, but once that took place, they were fine. Now, I'm saying this. I'm saying that uh, here David is, and David uh, uh, committed adultery, then he killed his friend, but God wrote it down so that all of us can learn not to do that. Uh, there's many other cases where there's Joseph got too close to Potiphar's wife, and you got a story written about that, and what's God doing? God's saying, okay, uh, I'll take the good, and I'll put it in the Bible to show you what to do, but I'm also going to take some bad that's happened in some people's lives, and I'm going to put that in the Bible to show you what not to do. So God guides us all the way through. You say, preacher, I'll never be perfect. I might as well give up. You should not give up because you have a perfect God that's not given up on you. Amen. May I say this as I draw it to a close here. Forty years, uh, Moses languished in the desert, and he learned what it was to wait on God. He learned what it was to be patient and wait on God. Oh, you think about now Moses, if you will, as uh, he gets ready to cross the Red Sea as the Egyptians now are coming very, very rapidly after him. And, and he knew what it was to be patient and hold the people and say, okay, it'll be all right, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. God will deliver us. You know, uh, the, the more that we are impatient about stuff, the more we go through things where God can take another thing and show us, here's where you need to be patient. Okay, let me ask you something. Does it get on your nerves when you're in traffic and it's not moving? Might it be that God says, hey, the reason that I moved you to the area is to teach you patience? Hello? Does it bother you when you're standing in line to check out and the person before you left their money in the car and everything it happened to me? Happened to me yesterday. I'm standing in line. There's two people in front of me. There's a dear lady, only one cash register open in the entire store with millions of people in the store. And so I'm standing right there at the cashier, and, and here's this lady, and, and they ring her all the way up, and then they ring her all the way up. She goes, starts searching through her purse, pulling things out of her purse. I can't find my credit card. And I'm thinking, now's not really the time for this. She said, but I know it was here. I just used it. I don't know. She said, wait a minute. She left her purse there, left all the stuff on the counter right there. Well, the employee's not going to pick it up. They could get in trouble. So it's all laying right there. What are we doing? We're just kind of standing, just kind of waiting. You know, she goes out to her car. And, all, and we could see her out the window. She's searching through her car. And all of a sudden, she backed out, and she held up her credit card. Found it! <laughs> she comes running back in. I was standing in line waiting on one dear lady to check out for at least 15 or 20 minutes. That sounds like eternity. But it isn't, is it? I pulled up in a parking lot the other day, and a person pulled up right behind. This ever happened to you? A person pulled up right beside. I'm talking about right beside. I'm talking about right beside me. Right after I pulled up, right beside me. Right, I'm talking about right beside me. And I'm sitting there thinking, I can't get out. Not only can I not get out, they can't get out. But if they try to get out before I get out, now my car is going to be like trucks going to be crunched. So I looked at them, and they looked at me. I said, and the person went, so what do you do? 
you sit there and go, <laughs> is that what you do? Yeah, you because know, what they're going to do is they're going to take that, that car door, they're going to open it and go, boom. <laughs> so I just said, huh. So I moved back. They got out of the car. Then I moved up, left that much. No, I did not. I did not. <laughs> I went and found another parking spot is what I did. Now, I'm saying this. Uh, don't be rash in your decisions. Why? Well, uh, now God will use them for his honor and for his glory, but do you really want people to learn by your mistakes? Do you want, ch you, you want parents in the church to look at your children that you're raising and say, I mean, new parents now, new parents, having kids, you know, they look at your kids and say, wow, I want my kids to be just like that. Or do they look at your kids and say, oh, oh, I hope my kid never turns out like that. How do they see your teenager? How do they see you as a young couple? Oh, that's a sweet young couple. Guess they just got married, always holding hands. You know, you see him at the door, and you know, he opens the door for her ever so polite. Waits till all of her body parts gets through. Goes out after her. See him in the parking lot. He's always opened the door for his wife. That's just sweet, a sweet couple. Wait till her body parts get in, shut the door. Goes around, gets in his, car, uh, his seat, drives down, make sure that she's buckled. He never does, but make sure that he's buck or she's buckled. <laughs> and drive down the road. And people watch that. Or it's like you stomp out and you're mad at each other all the time. You know? You go to the door and you wait for her to open the door. I mean, come on. I'm saying this. I'm saying that uh, our rash decisions can be used by God for his glory because he points them out to other people as lessons. Forty years later, Moses on the backside of the desert. God now gives him a second chance. Now, by the way, aren't you glad about this? Aren't you glad that we have a God that gets second and third, and fourth, and fifth, sixth, seventh, eight, nine, ten, hundreds of other chances. Amen. Aren't you glad about that? Amen. How many times have I preached a message and I went back to my office and said, oh, dear Lord, I'm sorry. That did not turn out the way that I wanted it to turn out. How many times have I done that? How many times have I preached the message and said, God, I think I was right on the mark tonight, and I want to give you all the honor and all the glory? Hello? How many times have uh, you tried to help a friend and you thought, man, I shouldn't have said that? If I wouldn't have said that, maybe they would still be my friend today. <laughs> and you realize you said something off-key, off-kilter, that turned them away from you. You know what God does? God uses those things to teach others teach others you know sometime and, and i'm not saying uh, go into a, your sinful past but sometimes as a parent maybe what you ought to do is say boy i remember the time when i was impatient let me tell you how that one turned out wow. train your children i remember the time that i, I was at the uh, men and boys camp out rebecca was on the uh, intercom with me and we we're talking and i'm driving and I, 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 you know, I, I talk to Beck as much as I possibly can, and, and I'm driving, and I didn't know that they had speed limits in the park. <laughs> and I'm driving across that bridge, all that water around me. Here, I'm just, I'm just cruising, just having a good time. I'm, I'm going camping. I'm meeting Jared out there. It's going to be a father and son camp out. It's going to be good. I mean, the, the Donner boys was going to uh, be with us. We're going to have a great time, <laughs> super time. Man, I'm heading across that water, and all of a sudden, this guy in a truck. You're not supposed to have uh, police stuff on top of a truck. That's just not right. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he pulled me over. He said, sir, do you realize you were doing 45 miles an hour in a 25-mile-an-hour zone? I said, to be honest with you, no. 
I said, I didn't even see. I was talking to my daughter on the phone. As a matter of fact, I'm still talking to her. I asked them this. I said, I said she's from North Carolina. You want to say hi? <laughs> and he said, no, no, that's all right. He said, uh, and I, I realize you're a family man and stuff like that. We had conversation and, and stuff, and he said, look, I'm, you know, that, that's fine. Don't worry about nothing. He said, yeah, just, just slow it down next time. He said, keep it under 45. He said, just, just, he said, matter of fact, just do the speed limit. That'd probably be better. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I appreciate it so very much. And he let me go. You know, well, I was thankful about that. I mean, last year, Brother Butler was going, he's going 75 miles an hour over it and let him go too. So I was, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> God uses those mistakes, though, to train us and to teach us. There's so many things that God can use in your life. But don't get discouraged about it. Don't, don't be this defeatist person. Don't do that. Well, you know, I failed, and so I guess God will never use me again. No, you have a God that will. Amen. Unless you give up on yourself. When you give up on yourself, then you're in big trouble. Amen. But you have a God that would take your life and use your life for his honor, for his glory. But don't be impatient with him. It's funny, it's always the freshmen that come to our Bible college that say, I got to go serve God now. I just got to do it. And I'm thinking, who's going to listen to an 18-year-old? What do you have to tell them? This is how I was used of God to build a church. Let me help you in your church. That doesn't work that way. Let me tell you, I've been reading my Bible for two and a half years, and this is what I can teach you. It doesn't work that way. I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm not trying to be hurt. I'm just telling you that it, it's good to learn and grow and learn and grow. I'm so happy I'm 58 years old. I'm so happy about that. I'm a happy 58-year-old. You know why? Because of the things I've learned over the years that I've appropriated in my life, and I'm glad I am where I am today. I'd hate to still be learning those lessons that I learned when I was 45 and 55. And, uh, you know, I'd hate to have to go back and relearn those again. I'm saying this. Don't be impatient with God. Father, help us tonight, I pray.